right. So please tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and how you became interested in the women in the priesthood movement. And whichever one of you wants to start can start. So uh, my name is Nancy Ross, and I live in St. George, Utah, and I am a former Mormon. And it was about seven years ago that I left the LDS church, seven-ish years ago that I left the LDS church and started participating in Community of Christ. And about a decade ago, I started getting interested in this issue of women in Christian history, and my children were kind of little at the time. Um, they're 14 and 15 now, but they were they were kind of little at the time, and I was trying to figure out how to get back into a scholarship in, in a more serious way. So I just basically interlibrary loaned everything I you know, to the max of what I could from my university. And one of the books that I interlibrary loaned was Gary Macy's Hidden History of Women's Ordination, which suggested that at least a few women in early Christianity had been ordained or had had more expansive roles in the church. And I thought, you know, what an interesting thing. And so this led me to be involved, and this is something I started started thinking about a lot and reflecting more on my experiences as an LDS woman. Uh, when the ordained women movement popped up in 2013, I immediately knew that that was for me and started participating in that and was soon on the board of ordained women and saw a friend of mine, Kate Kelly, excommunicated and was still left with faith, but maybe diminishing faith in my church. And Eventually, I ended up leaving the LDS church, and then Community of Christ seemed like a natural place to to try. And yeah, so, and 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 of course, one of the two of the most important things for me in that decision were the ordination of women and the inclusion of LGBT folks, or at least you know that as a project that the church was willing to work on. So my interest in women's ordination is really very, very, very personal. And I've continued to study women's ordination in the LDS church and other churches and be and be, and beyond that and now in in community of Christ. So that's that's just a little bit about about me. It, it's ultimately quite self-serving. So David <laughs> I'm David Howlett. I'm from an RLDS Community of Christ Heritage family, and my earliest memories of church life were, among them, were people arguing about women's ordination. My family came down on the side of folks in the 1980s that rejected women's ordination as part of a <clears throat> liberalizing trend in the then RLDS church. And I grew up in the Restoration Branches movement, which met independently of the RLDS church after the passage of women's ordination. Even as a teenager, I experienced cognitive dissonance over the idea that I was part of a group that rejected women's ordination. So I looked around me and saw very capable folks who were women who would not be called to the priesthood ever. So fast forward in my mid twenties, I renewed my membership in Community of Christ. I'd been baptized in the RLDS church at age eight in 1986. And by that point, I had come to the point where I believed in the, what the church had done in the 60s and 70s and 80s in terms of the, the changes that had been made, and they made a lot of sense to me. And it was a community I wanted to embrace. And so I, I joined the movement. I became a historian of religion in America. Um, so it's a, an area which I am interested in professionally too. And added to that, just the general topic of women's ordination, I am married to an Episcopal priest. Um, so it's a very beyond simply believing women's ordination. It's also part of my family. All right. Thank you guys both very much. So this actually leads us into kind of the next question, which is please tell our listeners about the movement in the RLDS slash now community of Christ to ordain women. David, you kind of touched on that a little bit, but for our listeners who might not really know that story. Yeah, so this is a really long history, and I think while we think of this as really picking up steam in the RLDS church in the 1970s and through the early 80s, that, you know, their, their RLDS history is really full of moments of touching on this topic. Um, we've got rogue, a rogue ordination that is reported in, I think it's the 1880s, of 
of, of a woman who was ordained because the priesthood leader felt called by the spirit to do so. And, you know, but the practice was not, not taken up broadly after that. And then I believe it's in the 20s after the passage of the 19th Amendment, where there is a conversation that is reported in the Herald, I believe. Is that right, David? Yes. Yeah, where it's like where the possibility of women's ordination is opened up. And then it's really over the next 50 years, it's 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 not yet realized. But in the 70s, it seems like there is a lot more in the kind of the wake of the women's movement, there's just a lot more discussion and then a lot more controversy over, over this issue. It becomes, it becomes more pressing. David, what, what, did, what did I miss out there? What, what, other, what other details, uh, or do you want to pick up from the 1970s? Oh, uh, well, one detail from the 1930s, which listeners yes. may or may not be familiar with, is that Frederick Madison Smith, then the RLDS prophet, on several occasions, considered ordaining a order of deaconesses in the RLDS church for the order of Dorcas. Uh, while that may not necessarily be the same as ordination to the Aaronic and the Melchizedek priesthood, it may or may not have been, he definitely was thinking about women's full ordination and shared that with one of his protégés, Garland Tickmeyer, and even told Garland Tickmeyer, who lived until the recent past, um, that. The church wasn't ready for it yet, but it would come, and it would come by revelation. And Garland Tickmeyer shared that at the 1984 conference, when 156 was being talked about on the floor of the conference. I don't think he's making it up. He shares it in the 70s as well. And it is completely plausible with what Fred M. was doing in the 1930s with the Order of Dorcas. And that's in the Saints Herald and in um, daily conference bulletins from the 1930s that talks about the Order of Dorcas being a possibility. So I mean, there's there's that, and then as um, Nancy was talking about, there's a lot of ferment in the 70s over this, where you have people writing editorials in an independent journal called Courage, um, which is started by primarily folks at Graceland University, Graceland College at the time, who are associated with the college at least, and they have editorials talking about it and presenting different views on it, because they want to present several views, even though they are a liberal journal, they're trying to have dialogue on this issue. And you have then the founding of grassroots feminist organizations in the 70s and early 80s, which have varying understandings of what priesthood and leadership should be. And some of these understandings include the full inclusion of women within the priesthood system. And some want to abolish the priesthood system altogether. Um, so there are, are varying strains of what that could look like among RLDS feminists, but in general, they all agree that the present priesthood system in the 70s was patriarchal and problematic. And I think that there is a legacy of both of those strands of thought in community, in community of Christ today, right? The sense that, you know, women, women should be ordained, and then they are, um, with the passage of 156, and then with the first ordinations in November of 85. And the community, our LD, the RLDS church ordains a lot of women very quickly. And ordination in, in our church is not necessarily the same as ordination in other churches, which are maybe have lengthy vetting processes and require, you know, significant higher education in order to receive ordination. But it, it is at least somewhat clear that in the first 10 years of ordination for, for the RLDS church, that ultimately the RLDS church ends up with having a greater percentage of its priesthood as women compared with other mainline traditions. So it's ordaining a lot of women very quickly and, and really seems to embrace that. So for instance, Nancy's talking about mainline traditions. The United Church of Christ is, um, the, <laughs> is the tradition in the mid nineties, for instance, which has maybe, I think it's like 23% of their ministers are women. Mm -hmm. And in Community Christ, it's more like 25%. Mm -hmm. So that just gives you some context. And the UCC is the most, at that time, liberal mainline Protestant denomination in, in terms of numbers of women who are yeah. then ordained as ministers. Yeah, and, and so, so, so there's that particular strain that is important. There's also the, um, we would like to abolish priesthood crowd, uh, which also end up, kind, and the implementation of that looks a lot like we would like to celebrate the office of member, 
Um, and that language and, and practice is still very much with us today, this idea that ministry then ends up being redefined as women become ordained. And there is a realization that that there isn't a need to restrict so much of ministry to people who hold the priesthood, but rather that um, members, people who are showing up on the Sunday can also offer ministry in various capacities in, in a role, in a role as member without ordination. This is paralleled almost exactly among Catholic feminists in the same era who start out advocating for women's ordination in the mid 70s. And by the late 70s, there's a significant group of Catholic feminists that are arguing for what they're calling women church, in which women without ordination participate together in a non-hierarchical form of sharing in terms of uh, what they would in sacraments and liturgy. And there are then Roman Catholic feminists who are want full ordination for women. And there's a split between those groups somewhat, and then a reconciliation more recently between groups as they admit that probably both are necessary, both women's ordination and also spaces for women to practice free of hierarchical uh, clerical control as well. And that's, that's a brief overview, but it, is, it just shows that what RLDS women are doing is part of a much larger thing that a lot of Christian women in the United States are doing and Australia and Great Britain and then if we can send this further, women's ordination is not simply a issue that's just about the Anglophone, primarily white world. It is also a global issue as you trace women's ordination movements across the world in the late 20th century. Um, that includes women of color and women on all continents. Yeah. And so I think that I think, you know, David brings up a number of really important things here, which is that what RLDS women are doing mimics and kind of follows in the footsteps of largely what Catholic women are doing. And that these two, and that the issue of women's ordination isn't just, do we ordain them or don't we ordain them? But it actually um, involves many more questions and issues, very much feminist issues, having to do with like power and how we organize institutions and how we handle things like hierarchy and who power is distributed to, right? So, so the women priest model still tries to preserve a hierarchical priesthood where the women church model is very much interested in that flat, a flattened sense of, you know, shared responsibility that is not at all hierarchical and does not require ordination. And these these two strains of thought about women's ordination are very much um, embedded within the movement to ordain women, as David just said, in, in the RLDS church. And what we have is that for some, for some women, when 156 passes, they are overjoyed. This, this is a wonderful moment. And for other women, they are deeply disappointed. And they, you know, and after the fact, they express this disappointment. Because in many ways, I think the women who express disappointment understood that abolishing priesthood was in fact much more radical. Um, and that it makes a little bit like conceded, like ordaining women more of a concession to maintaining a hierarchical priesthood. And, and so this begins to get, one of the reasons why, why I love studying this particular topic is because it gets complicated. And it gets complicated in, in this way, um, where those are, those are two fundamentally different models of organization. And people are drawn to them for, for fundamentally very different reasons. And, and, I, and I love how the stories of around women's ordination play out largely along these lines. And also some of the women who were more radical and more disappointed initially make peace with make peace with their with their own view with their own more radical views and ultimately accept ordination, but not all do as we are continuing to learn in some of these oral histories. Something that's interesting too that I just read in oral history yesterday uh, was that this conversation, which first initially starts with RLDS feminists in the 70s about um, should there be abolished priesthood, women in the priesthood, this, that conversation does make it into the conversations considered by RLDS apostles, the RLDS first presidency, where 
Wallace B. Smith was talking with his counselors about how can we change priesthood? It shouldn't just be add women and we should do something to change priesthood. And that, that is a serious debate in the First Presidency as they're thinking about how this will be implemented. And they don't have that debate except because they have heard about this from women who are part of grassroots feminist organizations in the earliest church, some of whom are RLDS employees, some of whom are not employees of the church or are, are members. But it's because of those conversations which were had by women in the 70s that they're even talking about these things in the mid-1980s. And so this movement to ordain re women really pushes the church on a, on a couple of different fronts. I think that there's, I can only ima imagine because we don't, we don't have all the internal, internal documents for the organization for, for all the details of the men's conversations, but I think that there's a sense, right, that, that men would see adding women to an existing system as being threatening and also um, women's threat of wanting to like burn it all down. And I, I tend to, to refer to refer to the women church model as just burning it all down as being even more threat right as being even more threatening or and 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 some of them probably and some of them definitely coming to see the virtue and the value of of considering these models and of ordaining women and it's important to remember that that both of these strains of thought end up influencing the ways in which the RLDS concept of ministry changes in the wake of women's ordination, which is not just to add women to the system, but rather to hear the initial, hear some of those initial concerns more seriously, which is that, you know, is exclusion an important Christian value, really, you know, it's, and, and, and to consider that, you know, in a service on a Sunday, you know, who can, who can do things, who can offer ministry, who can be seen as operating for the church in a public space important questions. So we've spoken a lot about the RLDS and the community of Christ. So I'd also like to talk a little bit um, about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and then I'd say the ongoing movement for women's ordination in that church. So the situation in the LDS church is so very different. Um, you know, one of the things that I love about studying our LDS history and with with regard to this topic is the ways in which our LDS women are really plugged into a more of a national conversation about what is what other women in other traditions are doing. The LDS church and its members don't necessarily participate in broader ecumenical conversations in the same way that our LDS women were doing in the 1970s and 80s and, and, and beyond. Uh, some of that stems from the LDS churches like one true church model. And so while they do form ecumenical partnerships for different kinds of social service, they don't speak about a universal church in the same way that the other traditions might. And so, but at the same time, Mormon feminists who started being interested or started, started whispering about women's ordination had a number of their own resources to draw on and Mormon feminists in, in the late 60s and the early 70s were very invested in digging up what early Mormon women had done and what their thoughts on such things were and how then to revive those conversations, which were largely the same, were to revive those conversations for in, in the late 20th century and then make more space for women. In the LDS Mormon feminist movement, until fairly recently, it's been it's been pretty pretty radical to to do something like advocate for the ordination of women. When I first part started participating in the Mormon feminist movement in two thousand and five, it was still like, well, you can be a Mormon feminist, but don't ask for don't ask for ordination. That that's like a, a few steps too far. And of course, by two thousand and thirteen, we see such a movement such a movement emerge, which really normalizes the question. Even for people who don't want it, it normal like it normalizes asking the question, like why, why does this exist? Um, why or why can't we ordain women? Um, or why can't women ask the question without um, serious, without a church court excommunicating them? And so this, this question lands in a very different place. 
the movement to ordain women in the LDS church never lands on a particular model and doesn't spend a lot of time uh, discussing what including women in the priesthood would even look like. And of course, in the LDS model of priesthood, today, boys 11 and older are all ordained, typically except or only except if there is like severe intellectual disability. And so, and so this is an almost universal thing for boys and men, cisgender boys and men in the LDS church, but is, but is not extended to women in the same way where priesthood in the RLDS church has always looked a little, looked a little different. Not all boys and men were ordained um, and not all women are ordained. And so then the movement for, for women's ordination really has spent very little time trying to imagine what that would even look like. And certainly you will get as many answers as people you ask, but there is still a sense then that women, women should have it. And that's kind of the most radical one, you know, such a radical point that it's almost, that, that there's very little ex exploration of what might come after such a thing. I think there's also a, um, as Nancy's <clears throat> alluding to here, there are some significant differences in terms of even if the word priesthood is used, how LDS and community Christ understand that at least at the theological level, there are significant differences um, in the sense that for members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the theology that undergirds priesthood also maintains there's something salvific that happens when someone holds priesthood that's involved in how they inherit an afterlife and their status in the afterlife and sharing that in common with a spouse who is a, a cease gendered man sharing that with a cis gendered woman uh, in the afterlife is, is part of this divine heavenly family. So more recently, you have seen members who are or leaders of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints talk about women holding priesthood in the temple, but not in public settings um, to do public ordinances like laying on of hands to bless of, of folks for healing, or blessing the sacrament. So the, the kinds of things that community Christ would call sacramental ministries. And what they mean by in the temple is that there are things given, powers given to individuals in the temple, which are assumed that women have in that sense, a kind of priesthood power, but it is in a sense, a private priesthood power or a temple priesthood power that doesn't extend to their authority really in the ward setting or congregation setting or more or less their assumed authority in families. Mm -hmm. Though there is some changing language around that, it's still more of a model of a priesthood holder who is a man having authority in the ward space and the family. Yeah, and that's that's one of the, I think from an institutional point of view, that's one of the more, inter that, that's kind of the development of or how the LDS church has responded to the women's ordination movement mm -hmm. isn't so much to shift a position as it is to shift the language while maintaining the existing position. And so in LDS temples, some of the ritual, well, some of the rituals are segregated by gender. And so that, and so because they are segregated by gender, it's inappropriate to have men in a women's, in, in an all women's space. And so that's where you have, in those segregated spaces is where you have women performing these very sacred ordinances, sacraments. But yeah, as David said, it doesn't really translate to, a, you know, out of the building. <laughs> and, and, and because temple ceremony is so taboo, and it, it, it's it's you know really kind of forbidden to discuss it, it's like well you might hold the priesthood, but it's important that you never that you never speak about this. And so um, there are right it's it, it's it's this tricky thing. It's 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 a tricky thing because it, the language changes, but nothing actually changed. And some and because of some temple ceremonies, some Mormon women also believe that they in fact do hold the priesthood through their husbands. But again, that is never very well explored in, in any space too. But a, shocking, a shockingly large percentage of, of Mormon women feel that they in fact do hold the priesthood and that that is possible through their like temple ceiling to their priesthood holding husband. But it's also not something it seems like they can ever exercise on their own. And so there is a lot of webs of words, web, webs of tricky words, whereas 
um, that, that are woven where somehow women might be able to, to, to have the priesthood, but definitely can't use it. Um, and, and, and that is, I think, ultimately, you know, some complicated mind gymnastics for Mormon women to work through, which does nothing to empower them in, in, in their family lives, in their church lives, or in the afterlife where they, where they remain secondary. Is there anything else that I haven't asked about um, that you guys would like to tell our listeners about that can go to either of you? I think this topic is a really exciting one to study for um, many reasons, but one of them is that there are a lot of folks who are intimately involved in the recent history of this that <laughs> are still alive and you know are, are among us and have memories of these things. So it's one thing to study something in the 19th century and then have to reconstruct it through various means that are mainly artifactual or document-based. It's another thing to be able to find someone and interview them. And that's some of the pleasures of studying this topic is to be able to talk to people and talk to them about their experiences and then piece together those experiences with the documents as well. And so that for me has been part of the excitement of not only is the topic important, but also it is recent enough that you can talk to people who experienced all of these things. Exactly. And there are so many interesting stories of, you know, really human stories that emerge as people discuss, you know, their their thoughts, their changing views on, on this issue and the kinds of conversations they had and the kinds of things that they did to advocate for change, um, as David said like hearing those stories, revisiting those stories and using those stories to craft a larger narrative. Um, that's part of the great joy of doing work like, like this. So that brings me to another question. Um, what are you guys planning to do with all this research that you're doing on this right now? Or for now, are you doing the research and figure out what to do with it next? Well, uh, right now um, we are churning out articles in various forms. Some of them are magazine articles. Um, we have an article that's coming out in the Saints Herald in a, oh, it should be sometime soonish, this year sometime, uh, that talks about one of the grassroots advocacy groups in the RLDS Church in the 70s, that's the group called AWARE, that goes way into the 1990s in terms of their meetings. We talk a little bit about them, and we're in part writing that article hoping that readers of the, of the Herald will also contact us and tell us some of their stories. And uh, we also uh, co-authored an article in the Mormon Studies Review giving an, an initial overview of this topic of women's ordination movements. And then we also had an article in the Christian Century, which is a mainline Protestant magazine that looked at former LDS women who went on to seminary and then their struggles with the language of calling. Um, you would think that, okay, women who then go to seminary who have left the LDS church, they they have a clear sense that women should, that they have an ordination call, and that's not the case. Um, so in that article, we, we look at how seminary and people around them help them articulate a deeply felt divine call that they had to ministry. So that's, that's, that's also a piece of this research of, if we're talking about ordaining Mormon women in a sense, these are former Mormon women, if you will, and they are ordained. <laughs> so. Indeed. Indeed. And really, there are growing, in Community of Christ, there are a growing number of, for not, not like huge numbers, but right, like there, there are now, you know, a, a couple of handfuls of women who are former, former members of the LDS Church, um, who have been ordained in Community of Christ, and who really were not, who, whose ability to use their gifts at church was something that they really desired in LDS sitting. And that was limited to greater and lesser degrees. And so, you know, I really see some of these women really excitingly living into their, their call. And that's, that's really kind of created something very new, new for them. I've been working with regard to the Mormon feminist movement and women's ordination in the LDS church. I've been working on this stuff for nearly a decade now. And David Howlett is, has, has been, you know, he has a tremendous depth of knowledge of the RLDS church and of community of Christ. And so 
we've we've written we've done a lot of preliminary work and we're beginning to maybe maybe talk about what a book would look like so so that that's kind of the next thing on our horizon is <laughs> what would it what would it look like to put these two traditions and their ordination movements which end up in very you know these are very different organizations they land in very different places with very different communities that kind of produce produce this activism and what would it look like to put these two traditions in dialogue with each other so so we're yeah I mean which is so so this is kind of what we're considering considering right now and when I when David first contacted me several years ago you know one of the, I think one of the first things that you told me David was that the 40th anniversary of 156 and of women's ordination would be coming up and maybe we could do something or you know or to, to that to that effect and you know, it's always difficult to predict exactly when things will, you know, things will be published and emerge. But, but I think we we could be like reasonably on track ish for you know, for something of that nature. All right. Uh, so last question. Oh, um, so what are? Oh, oh yeah, David, more. Go for it. Was was there something you wanted to say? Okay. So yeah, my last question is. So what resources would you recommend for people right now um, who want to learn more about women's ordination in the restoration movements? I guess, kind of as a whole, we touched on two today. I, we can plug our own articles, but <laughs> <laughs> feel free to do so. Uh, uh, we do have a recent article in the Mormon Studies Review, um, which the 2022 edition uh, of it that gives a, a brief overview. And even mm -hmm. any historian knows that once they publish something, they want to revise something. Sure, there's things we even want to revise even now in that article. And there's things we couldn't fit in because we had a word limit in that article. Uh, but that's that's a starting point. So there is a, if folks subscribe, have old editions or restoration studies, there's a 2012 edition of it in which at least four women share their stories of going through the ordination process where they experienced opposition from their local congregation or stake or family. <clears throat> it's a really good first person account of that. There's a 1989 book edited by Carol Anway which shares the stories of women's callings in the RLDS church to the priesthood. Um, it shares dozens of them. It's an old Herald House book. That might be harder to find. Mm -hmm. But the other book, which is really worth reading, which indirectly talks about this, touches on a little bit that I would suggest, and I'll turn over to Nancy for resources, would be Madeline Brunson's really excellent In the Bonds of Sisterhood, which is a institutional history of women's organizations in the restoration tradition that becomes the RLDS church, going back to the Joseph Smith movement in the 18, with the Nauvoo Female Relief Society, Emma Smith in the 1840s, and bringing it into that case to 1983. Madeline Brunson herself is an extraordinarily important RLDS feminist in the 1970s and 80s and beyond. So, and this is her professional work as an archivist and historian. It's also a Herald House book it's back in the day when Harold House is publishing very academic books in the early 80s. And this is one of those very, I mean, it's they're publishing theses and dissertations. This is a master's thesis published then. And so that's, it's a Harold House book from 83. You can find it in used bookstore stuff online. It, it stands the test of time. It's a fantastic resource. There is also, there are also a number of articles by Bill Russell. And so, um, you know, if you, if you, if you use Google Scholar and, 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 and look up, you know, Bill Russell's work and then, you know, follow his footnotes, you can, you can find a number, a, a number of things that he has written. There are also a few articles in the journal Dialogue, a journal of Mormon thought that particularly there's a good one. There are a few good ones. I think it's in late 84 or 85 where Madeline Brunson gives some of um, her initial reflections on what happened on the floor um, when 156 was passed. There's also some reflection by Paul Edwards in there. Uh, on the LDS side, there is a whole book on the history of women's ordination in the, uh, in the LDS church called Voices for Equality. I have co-authored a couple of chapters in there. And the editors of that volume are Gary and Gordon Shepard and Levina Fielding Anderson. And, you know, if people are interested in this question, there's the, order, you know, for the LDS church, there's also the Ordain Women website, which, which still exists, the Feminist Mormon Housewives blog, which is um, discussed many of these things at various times together with the Exponent blog, um, another Mormon feminist publication, uh, which has also discussed these issues for a very long time. 
And, and so, you know, on top of that, David and I continue to, to interview people um, about their experiences and try and flesh out those more personal, more personal details, where I think are less, less interested in what the institution did, and a little more interested in what the people did to make, <laughs> to kind of, to kind of what, they, what, what women experienced as they advocated as as they moved through the institution how, how they felt and that sort of thing a lot of these histories tend to focus on organizational decisions and decision making but that tends to cut out a lot of the a, a lot of the very compelling experience as people try to engage this question in their lives i also think something that's much broader just addressing the question of women's ordination there's a couple of works that are the one a a recent work that i think is has some really stunning conclusions. It's more of a social scientific work done by two political scientists, Cami Jo Bolin and Benjamin Knoll. Benjamin Knoll, yes. It's called She Preached the Word, and it's about women's ordination in America. And they're collecting social scientific data about what is the impact of women's ordination in America and, and chapter after chapter after chapter. And they show stunning conclusions that, for instance, if a girl grows up in a congregation where a woman is the primary minister of it, on average, for instance, she has a year more of education. She has uh, in increased self-efficacy uh, and she has increased, I mean, I could go down the line over and over and over again. There are no downsides, they conclude, for having women, <laughs> and mm -hmm. as even for conservative folks in these denominations, uh, there are no downsides for their activity rates, for instance. And it seems to be only upsides and very positive upsides, especially for girls and women in these denominations where women are the primary religious functionary. They lay that out and it's, it's a pretty solid work. And an earlier work is by, which is maybe dated, is from 1999, Mark Chase, Ordaining Women in, uh, ordaining women, uh, in America. I think it's Ordaining Women, a mm -hmm. sociologist too. I would look at the Kemi Jo Bull and... and Benjamin Knoll book before I look at the, the more dated Chaves work. Yes. They come to a number of exciting conclusions. Those sound awesome. I'm ready to go get them right now. <laughs> um, all right. Well, I think that's all of my questions. Uh, thank you guys so much for making time to meet with me to do this podcast. Thanks. We're happy to thank chat. You. Yes. Yeah. We want to thank you for tuning in to the Whitmer Cast. John Whitmer Historical Association is an educational nonprofit institution. For more information, visit jwha.info, where you can meet our team and join the association, read past issues of the JWHA Journal, and get updates on upcoming conferences and events. Our theme music is I Love to Tell the Story, composed by Tom Moraine. This podcast is a production of John Whitmer Historical Association, copyright August 2022. All rights reserved.